Uh, ladies and gentlemen, very good late afternoon. And it's nice to see that our room is still not empty, I would like to say, for such a late time. And uh, as you know, if we are talking about the afternoon sessions, especially about late afternoon sessions, uh, I'm as a moderator, and I assume our uh, panelists as well have uh, one more task to keep you awake all the time. Uh, I don't mean that we are now starting to tell you jokes instead of, of reports, but uh, okay, maybe there will be some. Um, I don't know. Uh, so uh, you see on our screens the subject of uh, our uh, current panel's uh, discussion. And uh, let me uh, say a few words about the uh, subject before I'm uh, giving floor to, to, to our speakers. Uh, uh, thanks to our hostess, Skydrita Abrama, some points which is uh, this particular subject related were raised all, already. And that's why I'm not going to spend very much uh, speaker's time. Uh, just uh, I would like to raise maybe uh, some issues which, uh, 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 from my point of view, seems as an important ones uh, 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 in, in line with uh, uh, this subject. And uh, um, I mean, uh, we are talking here about uh, uh, certain uh, 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 market realities uh, which are still uh, rising, uh, uh, if not a lot, uh, but still a number of, of question, uh, question marks. Uh, uh, I don't think that we will be able to answer all of them, uh, but uh, 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 still some of them uh, are uh, coming in mind, uh, 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 such as uh, follows, should, uh, should uh, uh, the market structure where we have a number of uh, uh, big retail players and uh, uh, very many uh, suppliers uh, 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 char uh, characterized by, uh, by superior buyer power uh, of uh, large retailers, uh, yet which is below uh, uh, level of, of, uh, of classical uh, dominance. Can we define it uh, as a classical dominance? And uh, also, uh, how far uh, economic dependency of suppliers be uh, corrected by, by the certain regulations. Uh, which kind of regulation would be uh, uh, most suitable for these uh, purposes? And uh, most importantly, could it be uh, effective at the end of the day? Uh, uh, beyond uh, price uh, competition, should there uh, be sufficient uh, regard for the capacity of retail sector to invest and innovate, which is uh, really very important. And will it lead to greater consumer choice, choice and, and et cetera? I hope that some of these questions will be uh, uh, answered during uh, our discussions. And now I would like to, to introduce uh, uh, our uh, distinguished uh, uh, speakers. Uh, uh, the, the, the first speaker is uh, 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 Victoria uh, Daskolova. Is it the right pronunciation? Okay. Yes. Yeah, OK. Uh, uh, thank you. And uh, then uh, we have a professor, William Kovacic. Kovacic. 
Bill. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It will be done. Yes. Yeah. And Philip Show, as I understood correctly. Uh, so, and uh, now I will uh, uh, tell you a wo few words about uh, 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 our, uh, our uh, panelists, uh, uh, what, what, what they do and uh, this, which things they are busy. Uh, so, uh, Victoria is uh, an academic doctoral candidate at the uh, Philburg Law and Economic Center, is it correct? Yes, in uh, Tilburg University in Netherlands. Uh, uh, in addition to doing research, uh, Victoria uh, assists uh, faculty with uh, teaching, supervision and coordination in the fields uh, of EU law and EU competition law. And uh, uh, she also focuses on the legal and economic analysis of uh, so-called buyer power. Uh, uh, the uh, competition law and challenges for competition law enforcement. Uh, William uh, Kovacic, now it's right, yes. Still Bill. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 so uh, th there is a lot of words to tell about him. Uh, she, uh, he is a uh, global uh, competition professor of law and policy at the George Washington University Law School and uh, director of its uh, uh, competition law center. Uh, uh, he is uh, also author of a uh, number of uh, books. Since August 2017, he has served as a non-executive director on the board of the United Kingdom's, uh, Kingdom's competition and uh, Markets Authority. Uh, so, a uh, very active person, and we hope that we will um, uh, have here a very interesting presentation. And finally, Philip uh, Shaw, who is the uh, head of, of the Food Task Force at the Directorate General of Competition of the uh, uh, Europe. Uh, uh, European Commission. Uh, Commission. Uh, the task force is uh, working on uh, regulatory and antitrust issues in the food supply chain in Europe. Uh, that, these are the main uh, duties of uh, our third uh, panelist. And uh, now I think we can start uh, uh, our presentations. And uh, we are uh, uh, maybe in this sense slightly, slightly ex exceptional. We are st strongly keeping in place rule, ladies first. So Victoria, please go ahead. Thank you very much for this introduction. Um, my name is Victoria Deskova. I was already introduced. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, before I start speaking, I would like to thank uh, the organizers for this invitation. It's really an honor to be part of a very distinguished panel. And I would also like to thank for the, for the excellent organization, for the very warm welcome which I received in Latvia. So we're here today to talk about, uh, well, the food sector. Uh, it's a very important sector. Um, maybe I shouldn't go into too much detail, but... Uh, we know that food represents up to one-sixth of expenditure, expenditures of European consumers. It's also a sector in which uh, both on the retail side, on the production side, a lot of people are employed. So uh, there should be no, no doubt about uh, the economic and social significance of this sector. Now I'll give some background uh, to the issues that we're discussing, namely retailer bargaining power. 
Um, and let's take a step back and see how, how come we got to a, um, to a sector which is very concentrated in a lot of Europe. So, for the most part, a retail of food has been quite um, fragmented uh, for the most of history. So it was small shops versus small suppliers. Uh, but at a certain point, this changed, and um, namely since the 70s, uh, the retail concentration has been growing in Europe with different, diff to different degrees in different parts of Europe, but it has gr been growing. This has led, over time, to a significant change in the balance between buyers and suppliers, which has led to a lot of debate as to whether suppliers should receive extra protection, whether there are any real issues. Uh, before, before I start um, going into this with a bit more depth, uh, I wanted to point two things. Um, the developments are not unique to the EU. A lot of uh, countries are struggling or wondering, depending on the perspective that you want to take, uh, with the issue of retailer, food retailer uh, power. So uh, recently uh, in Australia, a code of conduct was adopted, very recently, I believe in March. Uh, and they're also facing the same issues and the same practices that we're talking about today. The second point I wanted to make before going deeper into the topic is that the developments are perhaps not unique to the grocery sector. So it, it was mentioned that in my study I look at buyer power, but I don't just look at food. I think buyer power can be a serious issue uh, in other sectors as well. Um, and perhaps it, it's worth reminding that a lot of the complaints that food suppliers voice um, essentially were voiced by a very different group of suppliers uh, in the case of uh, medical device suppliers to dominant purchasers who are government, uh, well, uh, government ministries and bodies. So what are the complaints that we hear in the food supply chain? Obviously the first one is excessively low prices, so the producers very often complain, we, we simply cannot cover our costs. But apart from that, uh, there are other complaints, and these are the so-called unfair trading practices. Now, this is a bit of a, an interesting term. I, I don't know of a term as such of unfair trading practice in EU law, but it was a term which we saw in the Commission's Green Paper of 2013. And uh, the Commission used the opportunity with the Green Paper to, to do a cons consultation and gather more information on these topics. So what are the UTPs defined by the European Commission? So these include lack of written contracts or ambiguous contract terms, uh, retroactive contract changes, unfair transfers of commercial risk, unfair use of information, unfair termination of contractual relationships. In addition to these, there have been complaints about the use of private labels in the grocery sector. Now, we don't have much time to go into depth and discuss what each of these um, different unfair trading practices might mean or what its economic impact might be. Uh, I think the common definition from the Green Paper or, or what, is, um, what the Commission came came to as a conclusion in the search of a definition was um, the fact that what all these practices had in common was that there was some power on one side. And um, essentially, from, from, from an academic pers perspective, I think it's very difficult to make a concrete statement as to um, uh, asking, for instance, for a slotting uh, allowance for, for, a, for a shelf fee, is that good or is that bad, is that contrary to efficiency or not. So it's put in this box of unfair trading practices, but, but we might wonder what it actually means for competition. So this leads me to the one million euro question. Uh, is retailer buyer power problematic under EU competition law? A lot of the, the complaints have, um, a, a, lot of the, a lot of the suppliers have claimed that the European competition rules should be applied. So the question is, should they be applied? Is there any scope for treating these types of issues under competition law? And um, I'm not just trying to be funny by saying it's a one million euro question because uh, the Commission has done a lot of studies, many of them quite pricey, 
uh, with a price tag of maybe up to a million euros. So obviously that's a very serious question which absorbs a lot of energy and costs a lot of money. Now what is the standard approach to buyer power? This is, um, this is essentially the, the core of my presentation and something um, that I would like to invite us to reflect on and to perhaps rethink. So the standard approach to buyer power uh, goes for non-intervention uh, non or limited intervention, especially at the EU level. And there are three main arguments underpinning the standard approach. So the first argument is the so-called consumer welfare or downstream effects argument. Um, and it goes something like this. So we have buyer power, but this is not necessarily bad. Um, the buyer can push the supplier to become more efficient, thereby extracting a lower price, which is then passed on to the consumer. The consumer benefits, even if not the whole surplus from this uh, transaction is passed on. Even if there's no effect, uh, we don't care unless there's consumer harm. So a variation of this argument, um, we might, um, yeah, we, we might see a variation of this in a more long-term perspective on consumer welfare, uh, in which we don't just care about the short-term price, but we also look at the implications for quality, uh, for investment and innovation. And I think uh, the study by DigiComp kind of went into this direction of, of testing this. The second argument is essentially a very deep suspicion about rent-seeking. So a lot, of, um, a lot of people who are active in, in authorities suspect farmers of simply being inefficient or um, not exploring actively enough other options. So the, the, their response is, um, well, perhaps they should try a bit harder or look for other suppliers who offer them better terms instead of coming and crying for protection to the competition authority. Now that's an argument that uh, I as a student of competition law am very um, sympathetic to or I, I very much agree with. I think authorities should remain very suspicious about such claims because essentially competition law is meant to protect the public interest and it's a perversion to see it protect a private interest. And then finally, the, the final argument or belief underpinning the standard approach is a preference uh, for other remedies. So the argument goes, perhaps indeed, if, if we have this problem, there could be other laws dealing with fairness, or you, you can use contract law or uh, self-regulation codes of conduct, and these would be effective in solving the problem. So the outcome has been, which uh, I've tried to put on the, well, respectively for you, left side or right side, uh, limited intervention at the EU level, uh, but also an uncertainty about the scope of the application of the competition rules. So continuously people keep wondering, do the rules apply to, to these issues or not? We, we haven't seen a case, so we don't know. And the preference for non-intervention or for other remedies has led to a proliferation of divergences in the EU uh, legal uh, landscape. And interestingly enough, uh, the fact that there has not been intervention does not mean that the problems have disappeared and that competition authorities uh, have not received complaints. In fact, pressure continues, and I believe a lot of national competition authorities are under a lot of pressure to enforce the laws or, to, uh, or national legislatures are under pressure to adopt such laws, and there's a legal possibility to do that under Regulation 1 2003. Now, I would like to offer three reasons to rethink the standard approach, perhaps a bit counterintuitively. Um, for, so my arguments are based on the state of the law uh, and also on concerns about the effect and effectiveness of the other laws, as well as about the role of competition law. So uh, my argument essentially is that perhaps there is an opportunity for the European level to step in and show the appropriate way to deal with these issues, applying a more economic approach and, uh, yeah, so what, what's the state of the law on buyer power? So th there are two sub-questions or um, sub 
arguments uh, in, in this respect. One of them has to do with, uh, can we treat buyer power under competition law? And the second one has to do with the consumer welfare question, which is also widely debated in the literature. So let's have a look at buyer power and competition law. What's the state of the law on that? There isn't much case law on buyer power, but from the little case law that we have, um, what we can conclude is that we cannot say that the rules do not apply to buyer power. Now I'm speaking like the court with quadruple negative, but uh, I hope I'll be forgiven for that. Um, so the commission itself has pursued buyer cartels. Uh, so these are the tobacco, uh, tobacco market sharing agreements. Um, but also the court in T-Mobile, which was a case essentially concerning information exchange between telecom operators with respect to the fees that they would pay to their distributors, so it, it concerned uh, upstream effects. The court found this to be a restriction of competition by object. If we look at the rules on vertical restraints, we know that the guidelines were uh, and, and the regulation was strengthened by adding a 30% market share threshold required for exemption on the purchasing side, precisely because of issues uh, or concerns about buyer power. And the commission itself in the guidelines discusses exclusive supply, exclusive distribution, and even the upfront access payments, which are no other thing than the shelf fees that are very often discussed. In terms of abuse of dominance, buyer power can be used not just uh, for exploitative purposes, so asking for excessively low prices or unfair trading terms. That was the case in the CICCE case, which concerned claims about excessively low pricing, um, prices received by French uh, film producers back in the day in, in the situation in which um, the purchasing side was essentially an ol oligopsony. Uh, and then there was also the British Airways case in which the Commission itself claimed that British Airways being a dominant purchaser on the market for air travel agency services was able to use this influence and by reducing this, uh, the, the fees paid to the, um, to the agents to essentially cause them to cause harm downstream. So a bit of a complicated theory but using upstream power in order to uh, enhance power downstream. And buyer power has also been discussed uh, in merger cases, so I've listed some of the, of the mergers in the food sector where the Commission has paid attention to buyer power issues. So really the Commission itself seems to care about buyer power, but we don't really see much engagement with respect to the, to the claims that we hear um, with respect to the food supply chain issues. Now the consumer welfare question is a difficult one um, because there was a lot of excitement with the more economic approach about consumer welfare as the goal. Um, but essentially it was introduced in, in soft law, it remains, to be embed it remains embedded in soft law, and it, it's always been one of several elements of analysis. So um, when, when we hear about the argument that competition law in Europe is only about consumer welfare. We might wonder what is consumer welfare, how do we define it, what do we do with that in practice. Uh, but we might also want to think what the court says about that. And the court in recent years has uh, sustained that EU competition law is not only about uh, consumer, the interests of consumers and has insisted that competition law aims to protect competition on the market as such, an effective competition on the internal market. So legally speaking, um, the absence of downstream effects should not necessarily be uh, a problem for pursuing such cases. So this leads, I'll, I'll skip a bit over that more quickly. Uh, so this leads to an interesting contradiction that on the one hand, we, we get signals from the court about consumer welfare. Um, we also know that the rules apply to buyer power and yet there seems to be some sort of resistance to applying the rules or to showing, uh, giving an example to, to national authorities. Now, I, I'd like to uh, spend a moment talking about the other laws as well. Uh, what are they? And um, I have been very lucky because the commission um, commissioned a report studying stricter national laws, stricter laws than 102. 
um, and uh, with specifically with an emphasis on the food sector. So that study was recently made uh, public. So I've used the information to sort of put together a table. I should probably make a correction and say that Latvia's uh, stricter competition law is in the retail sector, so not just uh, with respect to food. But we see essentially four types of laws. I mean, we, we could debate about the definitions, but that seems to be a useful way to think about it. So one of the, these would be a stricter competition law. So for instance, in Latvia, uh, for, for the retail trade, um, at a lower um, market share for, for dominance, um, such a position can be found. There are also specific practices that are prohibited. Uh, recently, also Finland introduced uh, such a law with 30% um, market share threshold, and the Czech Republic has had a significant market power law since 2010. Uh, Germany has had also a stricter competition law, um, but not food sector specific. Then we also see um, a very growing area of um, legislation, and that's legislation directly on UTPs. So this kind of legislation, whether it's introduced in the Commercial Act or in the competition law, this, this varies with the country. Um, it aims to, it, it targets specific practices, some of them discussed, uh, the practices discussed also by the Commission in the Green Paper. Uh, and and the, the goal is really to go after these practices, the late payments, uh, the, um, the, the, ask, uh, the asking for ret requirements for uh, retroactive discounts, etc. Um, the third very also interesting development is uh, our codes of conduct or private or soft regulation, we might also call it. So starting with the UK, a lot of countries were in inspired by, by the UK experience with the code. So they introduced other codes aiming to have suppliers and retailers agree on fairness in transactions and have the problem solve itself. And finally, and uh, these are very old laws, uh, they're the laws on economic dependency, most of them general. Now, I have several concerns with, with this um, trend in Europe. And there are several concerns that I will mention. I cannot go in too much de de depth uh, in, uh, with respect to all of them. But one of them is effectiveness. How much do we know about how effective these laws are? So there, there seems to be the argument that other laws are capable enough of solving these issues, so we should let, uh, let them be handled at the national level. But most of these are very recent. Um, um, developments, so we don't have information. Um, on private regulation and soft law, we know that the UK experience, which is considered a success, was in the beginning not a success. That's why it was determined that an adjudicator was necessary in addition to the code. Um, and what we know about the economic dependency laws was that their enforcement was quite difficult. So we might wonder to what extent they're effective, but we don't know yet. We don't have the information. Another reason to wonder uh, about what these laws are actually doing is um, a sheer concern with competition and with the impact on efficiency and competition in the internal market. So um, I, I cannot, uh, I, I don't know about the stricter competition laws, I, I don't have that much information about them, but it's very interesting that a lot of the legislation on unfair trading practices is essentially a form-based approach which is what the modernization agenda of the Commission was trying to escape from. So it, it wanted to, to emphasize an economic uh, reasoning, an, uh, an economic assessment of these practices instead of uh, saying, okay, uh, we have this kind of exclu exclusive dealing agreement, that's, that's already very bad. Um, so, uh, yeah. Oh. Might as well go to the concerns themselves. A uh, very strong other concern that I have is European integration and the impact on the internal market. So um, one, of, one of the concerns in the literature with such developments would be protectionism. So we might worry about uh, the fact that countries would use this opportunity to enact stricter laws in order to protect their own uh, suppliers. Curiously, um, I believe some anecdotal evidence suggests that 
enacting such a law is likely to send the retailers if they have the chance to source from elsewhere. So again, you might wonder uh, to what extent that's effective. But if we think about the internal market and what the internal market was trying to achieve, it was um, uniform conditions for trading. So on the one hand, there's a lot of effort being made in Europe also to har harmonize contract law, even to harmonize unfair dealing in terms of contracts. On the other hand, with respect to these particular practices, with respect to this particular sector, we see a lot of divergences. Um, so we might wonder, is this really the best, uh, the best choice, the best approach? Now finally, what, what, what is the role of competition? So we can speak a lot, a lot about the goals of competition and competition policy, but, but what is the role of, of EU competition law? So we might think that it's protecting efficiency, growth, consumer interest, making European companies more competitive, and also the internal market, achieving this integration and level playing field. But we might also think of competition law as establishing some basic norms uh, what Commissioner Vestager was talking about this morning, some common values that, are, that hold everywhere in the internal market. And as such, it is part of the economic constitution of the EU. So when we see a lot of, um, so we, when we see a step away from competition law to very national approaches, we might wonder, are we stepping away from these values or, or not? And finally, I wanted to make, uh, to make a link with the modernization agenda. So the whole goal of modernizing competition law in Europe and the introduction of the more economic approach was, well, threefold maybe. Um, on the one hand, more economically sensible enforcement, a move away from the form-based approach. Also, more efficient enforcement through decentralization, getting the national competition authorities to, to look at problems, local markets, and overall this leading to more competition law enforcement in Europe. All this without compromising uniformity of decision-making and quality of decision-making. So in a way, the, the more economic approach was introduced as this um, common language for, for authorities in Europe, for, for you to communicate, for us to communicate. But by taking some of these issues, and as, as I said, a lot of these issues are market power issues, they could be looked at with competition, eyes with, with, uh, with a more economic approach. Are we not going in a different direction? So uh, we have competition law and a more economic approach in one direction, and at the member state level we have unfair trading practices, below cost selling prohibitions, grocery sector laws. Um, funnily enough, again, um, if we were to ask competition law agencies, perhaps they would advocate against many of these laws. So to conclude, perhaps this is an opportunity for the European Commission to set some examples by enforcing competition law in this area, by taking a closer look at these issues. Uh, I think certainly national authorities could use some guidelines uh, and some help with their own enforcement. And I believe that from the perspective of legal certainty, and efficiency, perhaps even effectiveness and coherence of law, this would be, uh, this would be uh, very useful. And not to forget the level playing field. Thank you very much. This was absolutely precise speech concerning this timing. All zeros. Thank you very much, Victoria. William, floor is yours. I'm very grateful to our hosts, to the chairwoman of the authority and her wonderful team for putting this program together. Uh, the only people who think it's easy to do have never done one. Uh, and the flawless precision with which things have gone on are a testament to the enormous effort behind the scenes. I'm also delighted uh, to be here to talk about this topic from the perspective both of developments in the United Kingdom and in the, in the United States, uh, to look at both jurisdictions, each with some common approaches, but also some important dissimilarities. 
And my aim here is to talk not simply about the treatment of retailer buying power, uh, but also to say something about the way in which a competition authority can go about addressing an extremely difficult and complex policy issue that involves fast-changing industry circumstances, the choice among a variety of different legal uh, policy-making strategies, and to do it in a way that achieves good forward-looking policy results. To do this, I'd like to talk about, uh, first, the commercial context in which things are taking place, uh, to underscore the extraordinarily dynamic nature of change in the retail sector and how that puts tremendous pressure on the capacity of competition authorities to make good judgments in this area and to anticipate one theme, how this underscores the importance for competition agencies individually or collectively to make significant investments in research and development. Then to give you a bit of a view about how the UK and the US each have chosen from a diverse collection of policy making tools to make policy in this area and indeed as Victoria was just saying, in many ways not by recourse to formal law enforcement but instead by use of what Victoria correctly calls soft and sometimes a little bit edgy regulatory tools that do not involve going into the courtroom. And then to give you some specific applications. Uh, in doing this, though I'm not talking at it from a position of authority within the CMA, I am going to be drawing upon CMA examples, but I'm not offering you an official view from the CMA. Uh, but in doing this, I am going to be using the comparative perspective that I referred to. I want to highlight a couple of resources for you that I find very interesting in looking at the topic. First is a recent paper by Jack Kirkwood, a wonderful scholar in the United States, who gives a brilliant discussion of the Apple eBooks case, which I'll mention a bit. But most of all, if you want a good primer on the basic economics of the subject matter, Jack's paper provides it in a very clear and accessible way written for attorneys, but also, I think, informative for economists. I very much like a research paper that Victoria published through TILAC, a very nice case study involving uh, private labels in the grocery sector, nice empirical work by a rising scholar in Europe, and then the Dobson paper, which gives you excellent background on developments in the, in the United Kingdom itself. And you'll see in Philippe's presentation, he has some excellent links to the superior research that the Commission has been doing, uh, research in which he's been playing an integral, integral part. What about the commercial context? Uh, what makes this problem hard and difficult to address? It moves so quickly. I would say especially in the United States, but globally, uh, the traditional method of distributing goods of the kind we're talking about, be it books, be it groceries has been changing in a dramatic way, either because the technology is forcing basic changes in the way in which producers and their distributors go about working, or because of innovative changes in business models that are altering the way in which traditional service providers have been doing their work. Uh, strikingly, the case of book publishing and e-books. Uh, if you had predicted a mere 15 years ago that Amazon would become the world's bookseller, that it would become the dominant venue through which many people buy books and goods and services, you probably would not be here because of any financial necessity because you would have bought the stock and you'd be here just because it's an interesting topic. Not because you had to, if you had made that prediction. Uh, similarly, what's taking place in the retailing sector for groceries? Uh, just to take a couple of uh, examples that stand out. Uh, here as well, uh, you see in North America, for example, the way in which Aldi, well known to Europeans, but a relatively recent entrant into North America, has been eating a number of the traditional retailers alive. And it's gone from zero to much greater than zero in a number of metropolitan areas with a concept and a plan that's different and attractive to those who are budget conscious and purchasing products. On the other end of the spectrum, you have the emergence of Whole Foods. Whole Foods is the fantasy camp for adults who like foods. You go into a Whole Foods store and you start by seeing the pyramids of vegetables, of fruits, 
Uh, they're glistening because attendants go about with little misters and spray them, so it gives you that wonderful, fresh, tropical look. If you want 30 variants of virgin olive oil, olive oil, you can buy them there too. They'll sell you the wine and as well as prepared meals that you can eat on site or take home. What's their target? Low income individuals? No. Uh, in the business, Whole Foods is known as Whole Paycheck because when you go into Whole Foods, you leave behind your whole paycheck to fill up the basket. That's how expensive it is. Uh, but as Aldi is a lower end, lower cost form of entry, Whole Foods has come in at the top end and in many ways has changed the way retailing takes place. Um, also a caution about uh, the position of the traditional firms. If I'd asked you five years ago in the UK, how's Tesco doing? Very well. In the past accounting year, they recently announced they have lost 6.5 billion pounds. 6.5 billion dollar, pounds, dollars. No, that's uh, 6.5 billion, billion pounds. It's about 20 million, billion US dollars. Just kidding, the exchange rate isn't that bad. But if you look at the overall trend there, that's a staggeringly bad result for a firm whose position even recently seemed to be unassailable in the UK grocery market. Just to suggest to you that there's a tremendous amount of instability and turmoil in this field. And I think what that means is that at the same time that competition authorities are formulating plans for enforcement or other forms of intervention, it's terribly important for them to consider how the base of knowledge they're relying upon needs upgrading and updating over time. Uh, so again, I think an integral element of good policy making in this field is for individual authorities doing their own research or in combination with others to continue to do the kinds of market studies that track and analyze changes in this area and indeed to evaluate the wisdom of policy choices that they made, including the choice of instruments an issue that was so nicely highlighted in Victoria's presentation. What does the policy portfolio look like? Sarunas made the very nice point earlier today that the question for agencies is problem solving and to pick the policy tools that allow you, first of all, to do an accurate, thoughtful diagnosis of the phenomenon you're observing and then to pick the best solution. And I think there's an increasing awareness that the agency that is best positioned to do this is an agency that has the right portfolio of tools. That's why there's so much interest in different settings about laying out not simply substantive analytical concepts that can be applied to specific problems, but thinking about assembling the right collection of policy instruments to address those. In some ways, the US and the UK have an enviably nice diversity of those tools. They both are not simply competition agencies, but they are also consumer protection agencies. How might that help? A lot of the interesting research that's been doing this, done in this area focuses on what motivates consumers to make particular choices, what accounts for the entry and emergence of new firms in specific sectors, why and in what way do individual consumers make choice? That can be a nice import from the consumer protection side of what the agency does into the formulation of competition policy. And to the extent you put aside for a moment cautions about whether adjustments in contract terms constitute the right way to make policy in this area, if you're going to experiment with changes in contract terms, which has been a policy approach in the UK, and in the many other countries that you saw in Victoria's slide. If you're going to do that, it really helps to have the background in contract law and in contract law enforcement that is often a core element of what comes from consumer protection. Law enforcement, of course, uh, but crucially here, what I'd call research and development. What's that? That's the investment that an agency makes in getting smarter. This is the investment in the body of knowledge that makes it possible to intervene in a way that's sensible. And in light of the dynamic nature of these markets and ongoing investment in this kind of activity is important. Can I tell you what percentage of the budget ought to be devoted to R&D in the form of market studies or research? I can't. I can tell you what the wrong number is. That's zero. And if you're doing work in this area and you want to be smart and knowledgeable about what is an extremely dynamic environment, you have to be making investments 
so that you understand what you're observing. Because understanding the basic nature of the industry context is important. And to partly answer Victoria's question posed on her slide about soft instruments, if you've made a major investment or a wager on the importance of adjusting contract terms, if you think that's the way to go about things here, you ought to be investing some effort to look back and ask how it's working. What's been the effect of using the soft policy tools that appeared on the roster of countries that have been doing things other than enforcement? And yes, indeed, in some instances, advocacy, as I'll say in a moment, that's been a core part of the UK approach using market inquiries, using the market studies power to go about examining specific industry configurations and making recommendations that involve changes in policy domains outside what might be more narrowly defined as competition law. What about law enforcement as a policy tool? As a generalization, both in the United Kingdom and in the United States, conventional competition law enforcement has not been a key policy response in this area. The United States made a major effort in the mid-1930s to develop what was, in effect, an activity-specific form of controls called the Robinson-Patman Act. It was a basic reaction to the amalgamation of market power by chain stores. And the chain store that was going to live forever and dominate grocery retailing was called the Atlantic and Pacific Tea Company, a and &P a company that is now in the past, no longer in the future. There was a problem with the law. It unabashedly and proudly sought to freeze the existing configuration of retailing in place, a configuration that gave a major role to smaller independent grocery stores. If you'd ask legislators what about the impact on consumer well-being, they would have said, it doesn't matter. Isn't this protectionist legislation? Legislators would have said yes and proudly so. And that emphasis on keeping in place an existing configuration rather than examining the terms in which an evolution to a newer business model might be done ultimately cramped the law. The US federal agencies basically don't enforce this law anymore. Two cases in the past 25 years, not since 2000. Not a robust enforcement presence. Some activity looking at these issues in merger review, but I wouldn't say in a way that yields distinctive analytical results. One case that is interesting because it involves an effort of suppliers to push back on a dominant purchaser. Who's the dominant purchaser in the story? It's Amazon and the sale of electronic books. Who was pushing back? First and foremost, book publishers that did not like seeing their first edition sold electronically at $9.99 a copy. They wanted $12.99, maybe $14.99. Apple stepped forward and said, we'll help you out. We'd rather have $12.99 or $14.99. And they orchestrated a plan to resist Amazon, essentially by imposing what's called an agency model, which said, you will only acquire the right to sell these titles essentially on a consignment basis. We still own the compositions and we collectively will set the price and you will charge the price that we set for our compositions. It, success, it succeeded in pushing up the price. Was there an agreement? Unmistakably. Was the aim of the agreement in many ways to raise the price of electronic books? Definitely. The interesting question in the, back of the background of the case that has been argued I doubt successfully here is, is the real problem the conspiracy of the book publishers and Apple, or was the real problem Amazon? And the argument that the publishers, the defendants, Apple had been making is, Amazon was the problem, with a market share of about 90% of all electronic titles sold for first editions. They're the problem with 90%. What we did was pro-entry. Did we raise the price? Well, yeah, a little. Uh, were we happy to do it? Of course. We did it and we enjoyed it. But the benefit they're saying over time is that it was better to have another significant ebook seller, Apple, Barnes & Noble, others, than to have one that was controlling this gatekeeping function. Uh, I doubt that argument will work in this case in the appellate process. But a question it raises is, are there instances, if you assume the stylized example of a monopsonist 
or a firm with substantial buying power that imposes some threat to the vitality of the suppliers and discourages their incentives to invest, is a cartel ever an appropriate way to resist what they're doing? Uh, antitrust law conventionally to this point has said no to that. Uh, Jack Kirkwood's paper in identifies some somewhat austere circumstances in which competition law might give a different answer. Uh, with respect at least to another area, and Victoria had the nice, nice uh, comment, the example of the British Airways case. In the US, abusive dominance uh, doctrine is so unfavorable as a basis for moving the law here. On almost precisely the same facts on which the European courts found an infringement in the British Airways case, the US appellate court found none at all and dismissed the case out of hand. Uh, not likely at the moment to see how abusive dominance doctrine, certainly in the US, is going to make much of a difference in this, in this arena. Uh, to finish with a couple of research and development examples, where the action has been in the use of market inquiries, and the United Kingdom example is the most interesting. Several grocery studies, one that related, re resulted in the promulgation of what's called the Grocery Supply Code of Practice. This is designed to adjust contract terms by mandating a change in the defaults. Are those changes which deal, for example, in an obligation to work in good faith, not to retroactively change contract terms, not to unilaterally change contract terms, not in related ways to abuse the position of the power buyer, do those promise to be good for superior performance in retailing or not? They could. Let me give you the sanguine possibility. That is, what they're essentially doing is putting a bit of muscle behind traditional concepts that say that post-contractual opportunism is inappropriate. Does contract law, for example, have anything good to say about unilateral changes in contract terms? No. Does it have much to say about the addition of terms that weren't bargained for ex ante? No. Does it have much good to say about opportunistic behavior by which one party encourages the other to make contract firm specific investments in one relationship and then steps back and seeks to renege either by not paying or terminating the relationship of the supplier that's made the investments. Generally contract law doesn't have a lot of good things to say about that. To the extent that in the United Kingdom and in other countries the focus on unfair contract terms is, is rigorously applied to those kinds of behavior, perhaps in that instance the story comes out well. If it's merely a mechanism on the other side of the fence for suppliers to repudiate agreements to give effect to, to the regret contingency, which is, gosh, I wish I'd gotten better terms. If that's all that happens, then the application of the provisions is unlikely to be effective. Do we know which of those hypotheses is true? Not yet, but that's where an investment in continuing effort to assess outcomes after the fact would be useful, not just in the UK, but in other jurisdictions. The UK is committed to doing that kind of ex post evaluation. Who, by the way, can insist in that, assist in that effort? It's what Alan Fells, former head of the ACCC, is called co-producers. And one of the best relationships is the co-production that comes with the academic community that can be a great ally in doing this kind of work. Last, it is the network cooperation that comes across agencies. Suppose you say that's expensive for us to do alone. A good solution through ECN or other networks is the collective effort to answer these questions. Thank you. Thank you, William. Philip, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, good afternoon. It's the second time I'm in Riga. Last time was in 2011. Uh, I brought a team of inspectors to a rather large gas company. And the last time I already had the quite uh, impressive support from the NCA, the National Local National Commercial Authority. And uh, this time again, but in much nicer circumstances, we don't only get support, but a warm welcome. Uh, so I thank you for the invitation and for the opportunity to discuss this uh, important matter. Now, um, you heard both uh, a call to uh, uh, look at, um, um, where is the? Uh, on the table. On the table, okay. Um, 
a call to actually review our standard, uh, not only focus on uh, consumer welfare, but uh, also uh, um, a number of examples from Bill. At the same time, you never heard an instance of a case where buyer power of retailers was sanctioned. So why, why is it so? At the same time, everyone is uh, criticizing buyer power of retailers. Uh, that's what's keeping most uh, commercial authorities be busy on the food supply chain, including us. Uh, in fact, um, competition cases concerning re the retail sector and the whole supply chain represent only about 25%. The main source of antitrust violation in the food supply chain are not retailers so far. They have been food processors or manufacturers who've done essentially cartels. Um, so why is there so much hype on uh, retailer buyer power? To start with, I'd like to re recall that from a European competition law perspective, we are not concerned um, about bargaining power, we're concerned about buyer power. But what people call buyer power is often only bargaining power. Because when is there buyer power? There is buyer power when one buyer has a power over the whole market. Uh, and what people usually discuss is when a buyer has power over one seller, or maybe a few sellers, but not necessarily has an effect on the whole market. And that's what we should be concerned about from a competition law perspective, a competition enforcement perspective, is what is the impact on the overall market? There have been a number of um, um, uh, projects in this regard recently. Um, I'd like to focus on the two main projects which have assessed what the consumer sees. Uh, because there have been a number of other projects uh, trying to assess biopower at the wholesale level. There was an excellent sector inquiry by the Bundeskartalam, the German Commercial Authority. Uh, but there are only two projects which really try to look at what's ultimately delivered by markets to the consumer. One by the ECB, the central bank, on prices because they care about what's driving inflation. And one about choice innovation, uh, a project that we carried out and um, for which we published the result um, last uh, October. And I also will come back to recent enforcement because actually there have been cases about biopower violation of competition law recently in Europe. Now, what does the central bank uh, study tell us about prices? Because it was focused on prices. They have done, um, and both projects were exactly trying to do the same thing, is to, actually, uh, to try actually to econometrically relate the evolution of price, in the case of the ECB, with a number of factors we could, which could affect price. First, concentration factors and other competition factors, but also many other factors which are structural factors in the market. So there can be demand-related factors such as the wealth of the area, the unemployment, but there can be other factors such as uh, VAT rates uh, and other regulatory uh, factors. Um, both projects had the same approach, is to try to see econometrically through a correlation analysis, uh, um, a regression, uh, to see which factors would, have, would be more correlated and thus be more likely to have an impact on prices and choice innovation. In the case of the ECB, they covered the euro area, except Finland, Luxembourg and Cyprus, and um, they found out that downstream retail competition, meaning if there is lower retail concentration at the regional level, that means lower prices for the consumer, something which is supporting what we usually do, especially in mergers. That higher retail concentration at the wholesale level, at the procurement market level, means lower prices. So people complain about lower prices. They effectively not only exist at wholesale level, but they are transmitted downstream. And that's an important element for competition analysis. If there are lower prices at wholesale level and they are passed down at the retail level, why should we be concerned? The third thing is um, the concentration of suppliers has a very significant impact on price differences and its prices are higher where you have higher concentration of suppliers. And that's the missing element in most of the debate most of the time, is that people talk only about retailers, they don't talk about suppliers. And I'll come back to that because in our study, which was based on a very fine detail, we tried to measure what's happening at the shop level across hundreds of shops in Europe uh, uh, over 10 years. What was the evolution of choice and innovation and what were the drivers of it? 
Why did we carry out this rather rare exercise? I mean, it's more than a million euro question. We actually spent already 1.2 million through this study, and we don't have the full answer yet. So um, we, we, we think there are already some good elements to tell us which way to go. And the reason we carried out this study, this rare effort, is that people were arguing a very interesting competition problem, which we rarely face, which is if the buyers at the wholesale level buy too low, then the suppliers have too low margins, and in the long run, they have less resources to invest and create innovation. And nobody actually ever measured that. First of all, as commercial authorities, we're particularly obsessed with prices, so most of our investigations are essentially about prices. But secondly, um, innovation is usually considered only for IT cases at most. Uh, in fact, there is innovation also in food. Uh, just look at the, pic the, the, what you have on your shelves of your supermarkets uh, today compared to what you had 10 years ago. Allergen-free, uh, organic products, uh, many ready-made products are, were not available. So there is innovation. Um, and with this study, we have an interesting picture of what is happening and what is driving it. First of all, I'd like to recall that despite the claims that retail concentration is always increasing, uh, it is true that overall it's increasing for a very simple reason, is that modern retail is replacing traditional retail. So then, instead of having many small operators, indeed, on the overall grocery retail sector, you have slightly higher concentration gradually building up in all markets. But if you look at modern retail only, it's a very dynamic picture. And I come back to Bill's word, we need to think about the dynamic elements of the market. And actually, there are as many countries where the retail, modern retail concentration increased as countries where it decreased. So we have very active uh, modern retailers who, aren't, who have been entering each other's market. And more importantly, uh, if you look at the relative concentration of retailers and suppliers, people always say the retailers are the big guys in the room. Actually, we, the study was carried out on 23 product categories, and on a sample of the 14 largest member states, in half of the situations, the suppliers were bigger than the retailers. They were more concentrated. So the idea that we only have a buyer power problem is wrong. We also have very strong suppliers, and we should care about that. Actually, we cared very recently with a decision in mergers concerning uh, coffee capsules uh, this week. And just to give you a brief indication, that's um, for your reading on the way back home, um, you will see that there are categories where the three main suppliers in Europe represent 80 to 90 or sometimes more uh, percent of the market, far higher than retailers in virtually all markets, except maybe uh, two uh, member states. Um, and that's something that should never be forgotten. There is an issue with the concentration of suppliers. Now, what does the study tell us about choice? Despite the claims, choice continues to increase. It has continued to increase this, through the, the recession. However, innovation has been going down. So the claims that there is a problem with innovations are right. There is a problem with innovation, and not only quantitative ease has gone down, but innovation, con uh, according to the study, is focused on packaging innovation, much more than new products as it was uh, 10 years ago. Um, now, the, the answer is not immediately to say then there is a buyer problem, but what are the drivers for it? The main drivers, uh, econometrically, uh, according to the study, are the following ones. They are positive drivers and negative drivers. The positive ones, and that's very important, at the local level, the main driver is a positive one, is actually the opening of a new shop. So what creates innovation on the, shelves, the shop shelves is not a little more, a little less concentration um, at the local level. It's actually if you create a new shop. That makes a difference. And that's very important because that's what the, on the agenda of the European Commission for retail uh, is to allow more establishment because if we don't have modernized, uh, open uh, access to um, a new retail establishment, then, of course, we will cement the existing situations. The second thing is, of course, the more the product category, uh, the larger the product category, the, the bigger the size of the, mark, of, of the shops, the more innovation you have. That's just confirming that the, the uh, analysis was not completely uh, off the mark. And third, for, lastly, for innovation, importantly, 
despite the claims that um, by large retailers would be a problem, what the study shows is that in those markets, and here I'd like to put a very important caveat, it only concerns the markets which are moderately concerned in Europe, so a large part of national retail markets in Europe, but still not all of them. There, an increase, a relative increase of the concentration of retailers relative to suppliers is associated with more innovation. So that means it is apparently good that retailers become stronger, bigger in those markets, and that may be due to several reasons, in particular because the suppliers have become bigger, uh, but also, um, according to the consultants, there may be a number of business model explanations for why this is the case. Now, there are explanations for why innovation overall has been going down. And first of all, and that's why we have innovation decreasing in particular since 2008, is the main driver is the economic environment, whether an increase in unemployment or decrease in the wealth of the area. Also, the increased levels of supply concentration are driving down innovation. Uh, we, we always uh, consider it normal that if, you, if it's a more concentrated sector, uh, then you have less competition, but it shows also, of course, in innovation. And last but not least, a new issue which has not been looked at in details by competition authorities so far, is that the increased proportion of private label on the shelves of the shop, not at national level, but on the shelf of a shop, is driving down innovation in that shop. So that means the more private labels you have on the shelves of that shop, the less innovation, the fewer innovative products you have on the shops, shelves. Now, to, to try to picture it, I mean, uh, economists like to, to have this combination of the Schumpeter and Arrow theories where with Schumpeter, the bigger you are, the more you're able to innovate, but Arrow says after some time, if you're too big, then you start to be less innovative. What the study is possibly telling us is for a given I mean, uh, level of retail concentration, you would have uh, a certain level, uh, you could have this kind of bell-shaped curve, uh, and uh, when you start to grow the supply concentration, it starts to be good for innovation. At some point, it starts to go down. But what the study tells us is if you increase retail concentration, you probably move the uh, curve upwards, meaning that an increase in supply concentration can't be partly at least compensated by an increase in retailer concentration. Now, this does not mean there's no buyer power problem at all in retail markets in Europe. It just means that people should not jump to conclusion and say there is a problem. Apparently, we, we have been, the consumers are benefiting from lower prices and more innovation thanks to bigger retailers in many markets in Europe. That being said, we don't know the story for the very concentrated markets, especially the Nordic, the Baltics, which are all very concentrated in terms of modern retail and a few other markets. Um, and we need to understand further this issue about private labels. Why do private labels create, are associated with less innovation? There are a number of hypotheses that we're currently uh, studying uh, to see what could be the drivers that can be. Uh, consumer pattern uh, drivers, uh, there can be uh, practices by retailers which could drive that, and there can be other reasons. Now, commercial authorities are looking already into buyer problems, buyer power problems, because there are more and more buying alliances, and they are forced uh, to look at the problem. Um, and so um, we've had two very interesting recent cases in 2014, one by the Italian Commercial Authority concerning Centrale Italiana, um, which was an association of supermarket chains which were present in the center of Italy in particular. Um, and these uh, uh, supermarket chains were the, were the main competitors in certain areas. So then for the Commission Authority, it was clear that if it allowed this cooperation to continue, um, any possible benefit at the uh, wholesale level would actually not be passed on. So it asked the... Um, uh, the alliance to be dissolved, actually to be modified. In the Norwegian case, um, it's the biggest group, uh, the biggest retail chain, Norges Gropen, which had created an alliance with the fourth, fourth player on the market, a nailing player, but they were the main competitors, uh, the two main competitors in many areas. So actually, it, um, uh, it uh, tried to, um, it intervened uh, with, uh, by starting an investigation, 
And in the end, it stopped in the investigation because ICA uh, realized that this was not a, a model to survive in the market, and they were ultimately purchased by um, not number one, but uh, one of the two following players. So there are cases, and they relate to buying alliances. What the study tells us is there may be other cases. They may be related to private labels. Um, they, may be related, they may be materializing in very uh, concentrated retail markets, but we still have to investigate them, and we should distinguish the general debate about retailers are always bad uh, from the specific situations where there may be a problem for choice and innovation, and also maybe for prices. I would like to also note that it does not mean that competition law is irrelevant for the, the global debate on imbalances, because this whole uh, panel has a very nice picture to start with, which is you have retailers in one box and farmers in the other box. And um, it's not uh, pure luck because uh, of pure chance of uh, luck for the farmers uh, is that um, the whole debate is very much driven by farming associations because um, they consider they are being exploited by the retailers. In practice, they are selling very little of their produce directly to the retailers. Um, however, um, they've picked up on the retailers uh, to launch this uh, imbalance debate. Now, European competition law gives quite a few options for operators which are small to actually um, uh, supply together without infringing competition law. For the farmers themselves, there are quite a number of uh, 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 derogations, specifically for the farmers, but before ever, even going there, we have in European competition law a recognition that you can have operators selling together if they are small because they can create efficiencies because they are too small to reach a sufficient scale to reach certain, certain clients. And that is totally possible to have even pure joint sales uh, without any further efficiency that other than um, having sufficient scale to be able to deliver to certain clients. The second thing is they, these operators may also go downstream and they may go downstream, and our block exemption regulation says very clearly that they can go up to 20% downstream if they were not present downstream. So operators can get, may get together uh, to uh, gain some bargaining power. And for the farmers, as I said, um, this, um, uh, there are a number of specific derogations, including a brand new one on which we are publishing guidelines this year. Last but not least, the fact that there's buyer power actually not buyer power, but bargaining power by retailers, should never be an excuse for organizing cartels. And this is a growing problem. We've seen it in our own investigation uh, in, at the Commission, the retail packaging, uh, there, uh, the, in the retail packaging cartel investigation, the, um, the operators are claiming that this is due to by the, 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 the retailer's power. And very recently, in two cases in France, there was a private label dairy produ uh, producer cartel, and they argued that this was driven by the fact that they were facing very tough uh, buyers on the retail side. And um, uh, the one which was uh, published uh, this week, which um, uh, concerned poultry, also they claimed that this was driven by the bargaining, they said buyer, but bargaining power of the retailers. So this should not be an excuse. There may be buyer power problems, which we may have to address under competition law, but we should never forget we are here to actually care for essentially consumer welfare, not to uh, care for some kind of fair distribution of rents. This should be left to other purposes without too much restricting competition. Thank you. Uh, before we are starting our uh, question-answer part, I would like once again admit a uh, very high timing precisity from our speaker's side. Thank you very much for that. And now we can start to uh, uh, questions-answer se uh, session, please. No one has a question. I have just a, yes, a sort of um, 
Uh, Ms. Daskalova, you were elaborating um, on the codes of conduct that actually were recently um, adopted in Australia. Uh, so my question was how widespread are these codes of conduct? And if uh, they're actually efficient and effective, and is also the retail sector actually uh, the area that should be, well, should be um, somehow uh, viewed uh, in a view of code of conduct. <coughs> well, if it should be addressed in a way of code of conduct. So that was my question. So the question is, what are the code of conduct in They Australia? are prevalent everywhere, Elmo. Yeah. There are many of them. Uh, well, okay, there's only one in Australia, and it was recently uh, yeah, enacted. From what I was able to read in the news, I haven't visited to, to check that myself. So I think it's very early to make predictions about the effectiveness. Um, I think, okay, there are two, uh, two reasons maybe to be concerned about self-regulation or, or such remedies or relying on such remedies uh, to, to do the job. One is, uh, well, okay, a more cynical maybe perspective um, so you might think uh, essentially the enforcers don't want to do anything, so they just put, they just uh, ask the, the companies to solve the, the, problem, the, the problems themselves by setting up a code of conduct and then there's no follow up on how effective that is. So that's a more cynical way uh, to look at it. Another way to perhaps be concerned about the effectiveness um, is, well, in general, self-regulation on its own perhaps does not uh, deliver the, the results that we, that we hope for. That's why very often when there's self-regulation, no, I'm no expert on self-regulation, but based on, uh, well, on some reading of the literature, there's always need for some sort of government inter intervention. So it's a process that needs to be structured. It's a bit too optimistic to leave it all to self-regulation. So in the UK, as we see, the, the decision was made to add an adjudicator. Now, my concern, again, with that would be we have this for the, for the food supply. Next time we have an issue with, I don't know, the beer producers, the breweries, do we have another code and then another code and then another code? So you see that, that there are some, some reasons to be concerned about such an approach. So. Yeah, I'm more in favor of, of, a, of a well clear or clearer uh, understanding of the law in the background, and then such schemes can be can can perform a supplementary role, for instance. Please. Yeah, I'm I'm um, I'm a bit um, I was a bit disappointed in last year when when we were at the commission um, reviewing a bit all the unfair trading laws and 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 and, and self-regulatory initiatives uh, because. There are many such initiatives, there have been quite a number of laws, but we've not found any assessment ex post which showed the effects so far. I mean, they're very limited. There was a, an attempt in France on specific cases, uh, but there's no overall assessment of the effects of these laws. And that's, that's what's a bit challenging uh, conceptually because uh, there have been many attempts to do this, and sometimes, um, it's done very clearly for a fairness purpose. If it's a fairness purpose, you, you don't have to assess the overall economic impact. You, you've decided you want to do it for fairness, so then you just make sure you ensure fairness. But in a number of instances, it is justified by the fact that it would be good for uh, investment, for growth, for development, and so on. And there, I think we are getting confused uh, because uh, if it's for fairness, it's easy to identify. If it's for economic purposes, actually the studies, and that's, I, I've shown two which are available, uh, show that we don't necessarily have a problem. Um, and so we would, should be careful about when we regulate the relationships, whether this has a positive or a negative effect. And that's why we're so careful at the Commission to embark on any um, broader initiative on, on UTPs at this stage. Thank you, Philip. William. Uh, yes, the ACCC has been running a number of cases involving the new regime, and, and that is a compulsory uh, mechanism. I, I suppose I, I tend to characterize the UK regime as more compulsory than self-regulation. That is, uh, there is a there is a uh, enforcement mechanism that backs it up, uh, but that I think brings us back to the question of uh, how's it working out and with what effect. There's a uh, I can imagine how you design the study, and I think what you'd have to do is to look very carefully at instances in which 
the mechanism has actually been adjudicated in some sense. More examples there in Australia to use. Uh, but also uh, to look at, uh, try to assess the extent to which the redefinition of contractual positions and the redefinition of contractual defaults has altered the bargains that take place between suppliers and, and purchasers. And, and there again, uh, I'd be interested to know uh, whether the focus on unfairness is really an effort to codify in a more popular, in a more, in a more uh, powerful way uh, the longstanding contract, contract law prohibition on post-contractual opportunism. Uh, that is, if, it, if the answer to that question is yes, that has positive efficiency properties uh, as well as mere, mere equity uh, uh, objectives. If, on the other hand, it's, it's simply a mechanism by which I'm able to open an escape hatch to get away from terms that were sensibly bargained for, but just don't turn out the way I like, uh, the seller's remorse that, God, I could have sold it for more. Uh, if it's simply a way that I, 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 I escape from, the, uh, from, from that kind of commitment, uh, that does violence not only to contract law in that field, but uh, it can spill over into other areas too. And, and I'd, I'd, very, I'd be very interesting to see how these uh, more narrowly designed prototypes, what effects they have, before I'd unleash it on the rest of the retailing world. But uh, I do think it's an area that calls out for a lot of assessment. Thank you. Uh, any more questions from, uh, from the audience? Then I, I have one, one small question, probably the quite simple one, about the hidden discounts. Uh, what be, would be the indicators that could signal existence uh, of such uh, discounts? And maybe you have some examples from, from other countries. I, I, are you talking about what retailers usually call back margins? Uh, where, yeah. uh, okay, so let's explain the concept. Is, uh, it, it, it varies uh, between, uh, between retailers and between member states. Um, in certain member states, for certain retailers, uh, the sale is with a, a, a list price and you have a few discounts related to volumes, promotion and so on. And then you, there are a number of uh, situations in Europe um, uh, which were driven by the uh, main retailers which, who, which expanded east in Europe uh, like, uh, or south like Carrefour and Tesco. Uh, where, um, where the, the, the business model is a lot more complicated, where you have a list price, but actually it's not very much reflecting um, the final transaction. Uh, you have uh, some sometimes volume discounts, but you have many bizarre discounts related to certain supposed, su supposedly services by the retailer to the, to the supplier. Um, now, in practice, when you ask retailers, they don't necessarily relate to a specific service. Sometimes they are, they do, sometimes they don't. Um, and some people uh, say, well, this is hiding um, a, a, an abusive practice. It's not obvious. I mean, it's maybe just another way of negotiating a price. Um, and so that's why I would not immediately say, because there is a back margin, there is a problem. That be, it requires an assessment of what kind of uh, uh, discounts have been negotiated. I'd just like to raise a caution about adopting a policy that would make all discounting highly transparent and pricing more visible. And that is, uh, it would be a good friend to supplier cartels. Uh, if I'm running a supplier cartel, one of my great concerns, going back to Allison's presentation about the threats I face, is buyer resistance. Buyers see the prices going up and they push back. They say, I want deals. Uh, buyers usually are asked by the suppliers uh, to do this quietly and covertly. Uh, that is, it's the secret discounting, it's the secret uh, uh, off-list pricing that tends to unravel the cartel discipline. Uh, if I am a supplier trying to reinforce the effectiveness of my cartel, I'm begging competition authorities to impose a ban on, on, on hidden discounts. I, uh, I, I want them to, I want them to if, if possible, I want them to forbid significant retailers from getting better deals. Some more words. Yeah, yes, yeah, Phil. Actually, uh, um, France attempted to, um, to address the back margins through um, a below sale pro, uh, sales below cost prohibition. Uh, where um, um, it was a succession of laws, actually, uh, which tried to uh, 
uh, to chase the, the, the evolution of the, of the transaction practices of the retailers and the suppliers. And it was based on the idea that the price uh, re at the retail level should not never be below that the price on the, uh, on the, on the contract oh, at the wholesale yeah. level. The problem is that these back margins are not necessarily on the contract. So what happened afterwards in France is that um, then the retail price started to go up while the retailers and su uh, suppliers continued to just fight for the, sh the rent of it. Uh, and it created, according to certain economic tricks, studies by uh, French econometricians, that actually created even uh, up to 1% uh, increase in inflation uh, for over a, a period of several years. So you can have very bad unintended effects of trying to regulate the, uh, the procurement practices and the transfer pricing between suppliers and retailers. There's, there's a powerful amount of empirical evidence looking at this U.S. anti-price discrimination law, the Robinson-Patman Act, uh, that shows that it frequently reinforced cartel discipline by enabling suppliers when faced with a significant buyer who says, I think I know what's going on, but you're going to give me a good deal. I will pitch all my work to you if you give me a deep discount. It enabled the supplier to say, oh, to be a law-abiding citizen, I cannot violate the Robinson-Patman Act. I cannot give you the discount. Uh, the law, in effect, gave you a legal foundation on which to assert uh, a practice that would reinforce the cartel. If I can add yes, please. To, to this as well. So, um, I, I very much, I very much agree with uh, with well, what both of you are saying. There's need for an economic analysis of these issues and not to jump to conclusions. Um, unfortunately, I think the kind of the, the opposite is going on, right? Uh, we see a lot of very blunt tools being enacted. And I think we all agree that a more uh, fine uh, or deeper economic analysis of these issues is necessary. Um, now, I, I found it very interesting that, uh, to, to, to see in the study that one of the outcomes was uh, that entry of a new retailer or entry of a new shop introduced more innovation. And I think it's, it's worth looking into these practices, if not from a fairness perspective, from a pure competition perspective, because they can have exclusionary effects. Uh, a lot of them come in the packaging of fairness, uh, fair margins, etc. But at the end of the day, we might also be concerned and, uh, about seeing very old uh, friends or new friends of competition law, like uh, most favorite nation clauses, shelf fees, etc. So it, it's, it's something that, um, I believe it's important for competition authorities not to dismiss. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, they need to be very careful about and apply a very sensible analysis, but perhaps some guidance uh, from the Commission is much necessary in this respect. I, I'm, I'm not sure it needs to come always from the Commission. Uh, for most favored nation clauses, actually, there was a country where there were most favored nation clauses almost everywhere in retail distribution, it's Austria. And the Austrian Commission Authority is doing a good job of uprooting all these agreements and, 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 and prosecuting them and having them removed and sanctioned. So, but it's, it was a specific situation. Um, I'm not sure there are, not, there are so many places in Europe where you have lots of most favored nation. If there are, they should be tackled, of course, most favored nation clauses. Um, as regards retail establishment, I think it's a, it's a challenge that all Commission Authorities uh, face. They have all been doing advocacy on this. Uh, and it's been always a challenge uh, to, to, uh, to, to, to advocate this to our authorities because, of course, there are other concerns from a society uh, perspective. I think the study is, for the first time, providing very good evidence that it's not only important, it's actually the main factor at local level. What really creates a difference is this. And so uh, if, you, if, you, if you only have the same players all the time, they will be evolving very, very gradually, and you will not see a lot of uh, innovation, for example, for the consumer. And, and I, think, I think on that, mm -hmm. uh, a, a useful focal point for attention is to look at circumstances that either facilitate or frustrate entry. Yes. And one of, the, one of the superb findings from the UK uh, inquiries mm -hmm. is that a, a basic obstacle to new entry were land use controls, planning controls, what we call in North America zoning controls, uh, with related practices by firms, in effect, to buy up sites uh, that would be the most attractive path. Uh, um, I mean, an example in the US that was identified as well is that in, in California, if you want to stop entry by a new retailer, uh, most California counties have zoning-based controls 
that allow an objection to be made, which sets in motion a period of at least six months of a preparing a hearing and holding a hearing. Uh, that is, by raising a single objection, you buy yourself six months at least protection from, from entry. And of course, if you're, the, if you're the incumbent, do you establish a Citizens for Monopoly Rents at Retail Association? No. It's the Citizens Association to avoid traffic congestion and save the planet. Uh, they're the people who file the objection. Uh, and again, you have an interesting instance in which, to go back to our earlier panel, where you have public policies that, uh, that, that can have spillover effects with respect to, to retail entry. I think okay. Another interesting example is from Europe. Uh, I believe the Spanish uh, supermarket uh, case, uh, right? Where the Commission found that uh, in Spain, in order to open a new shop, uh, you required approval by a council, but people on the council were also competitors holding existing shops. So, also such intervention, essentially making sure there are competitive buying markets as well as selling markets. Uh, this change, yeah. thing, this okay. change thing, thanks to uh, the Commission intervention. Okay, yeah. uh, 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 dear participants, unfortunately our agenda's time is over and I feel that I, I, I will have one more bill because I was not able to manage precisely our timing at the end of the meeting. And uh, now, however, I, I still have uh, two uh, uh, invitations in my head. First is to thank our speakers once again. Please 